Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. And, and, uh, and, uh, salam, sh salam Shatori. How's that? <laughs> That's good. Jeff, Jeff, can I say something here? That sounded more like, are you a camel? Because Chetori and Shotori are two. <laughs> but well done. Well done for the first attempt. Good. Okay. Great. I'm turning off my camera for okay. the quality to remain the best. I'm sorry about it. And okay. Professor Krashen and Professor McCullin, you will stay on camera and on really? microphone both. Okay. So. Sorry. Are you recording this session? Yes, uh, Bahman. Yes. Uh, uh, Professor McCullin is recording the session himself. Oh, really? Thanks. Okay, so we'll we'll get started. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to apologize. Here uh, in Los Angeles, like in most places, we um, we don't have our businesses open because of the, the this crazy pandemic, and so I haven't had a chance to get my hair cut. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. It is, you know. Uh, so hopefully that'll that'll uh, won't bother too many people. All right. So today we're going to talk about. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about vocabulary acquisition. That's what I um, uh, I'm going to focus on. But uh, I've also been asked uh, to talk a little bit about the podcast and technology. So I'm going to do that. I hope towards the end. Now, I have to say I haven't given a talk to university level or anyone really uh, for the last ten years or so. So I'm a little out of practice. Uh, this is the first time that I've talked about this material, which means that one of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to take about 15 minutes and we'll run out of things to say, or it's going to take about three hours. So <laughs> somewhere between 15 minutes and three hours, that's what we're going to that's what we're going to do today. Let's keep it to I'll try to keep it to 45 minutes. OK. Um, I'm, I'm hearing some interference. I, I wonder if everybody can mute their microphone. It'll make it a little easier for the rest of it. Thank you. Um, so I want to start uh, talking about uh, language acquisition or, or vocabulary acquisition. And I'm going to start by giving you what we think is the, the best theory we have for how we improve our vocabulary. Are you ready? OK, here it goes. We improve our vocabulary when we get comprehensible input. There it is, right? Any questions? No. Uh, so, so that's the simple version, right? That's the, the and that's that is consistent with everything else we know about language acquisition. In other words, vocabulary is no different than any other system uh, or or part of language. We acquire it the same way by understanding messages, either by reading them or by listening to them. So that's where we're starting. That's what we think is our best guess about how vocabulary acquisition works. Now, we have a couple of reasons for thinking that's true. And I don't want to go through a lot of details of the studies. I, I want to sort of uh, focus more on the big picture here. So let me talk first about a couple of reasons why we think this is true. The first reason is that we have lots of evidence to show that if you read more, you have a bigger vocabulary, right? So people who read a lot have bigger vocabularies. That's the relationship. Now, that's, of course, just a relationship, what we call a correlation. That may not mean that reading more causes larger vocabulary size. So we actually do some experimental work. And there are two kinds of experiments I want to talk about, the short one and the long one. The short experiments that we can do are called uh, read and test studies. Read and test studies. And read and test studies are usually things that you do, uh, it takes maybe at 30 minutes, 45 minutes. You can do it in a single classroom. And the researchers bring in a group of students and the students are given a story to read or some text to read. And the story contains words that the students don't know or we don't think the students know. Okay. Now, 
you tell the students, okay, kids, read the story. You don't say anything else. You just tell them to read and understand the story. Then at the end, you collect the stories back and you say, oh, here's a surprise vocabulary test. Fill that out. You don't tell the kids before that they're going to take the vocabulary test because we want to see how much kids are picking up or how many students, I say kids, uh, how much students are picking up from the reading without focusing on the vocabulary. And so we take all those results and we've done this in English and we've done this in, in Spanish and we've done this in lots of different languages. So we think it's true for all languages. Uh, but in English in particular, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what we find from these read and test studies. And sure enough, what we find is that you do, in fact, pick up new words little by little as you read. Now, some estimates say it's 5% of the words or 5% of the meaning of words, of unknown words. Maybe it's 10%. Somewhere in that range of 5 to 10% uh, is what you're picking up as you're reading. So that's good news, right? Now, another thing that we can test is how many times a word has to appear before you acquire it. Well, there's no one answer because it depends on other things other than the number of repetitions, the, what we call the number of occurrences. But if you take a look at a lot of different studies, these read and test studies, uh, Paul Nation, who's one of the best researchers in vocabulary, uh, in the world and has been for the last 40 years. He's out of uh, New Zealand. Maybe some of you know uh, Paul Nation and his, his work. But Paul Nation looks at these studies. Uh, a few years ago, he, he looked at them and said, it seems as though somewhere between 10 and 15 repetitions is a good place where you can say you're going to pick up most of the words or a good part of the meaning of most of those words. 10 to 15 times. Now that's not an exact figure. Sometimes it's two times, sometimes it's 30 times. Nation actually used 12 times as the, as the standard. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about his work I, if we have time later on. So read and test studies tell us that we pick up words incrementally, that is we pick them up bit by bit as we're reading, and we pick them up incidentally, that is, when you read, nobody, nobody picks up a book and says, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna improve my German vocabulary today. I'm gonna read a book. No, right? We don't do that. We read because we're interested in what we're reading. We're, we read because we want to find out about something or be lost in the story, lost in the book. So we're focused on meaning. We're not focused on vocabulary. So that's why we say vocabulary acquisition is incidental. It's not the thing that you're going in there to do, but it's one of the results. It's one of the consequences of reading. I talked about short studies and long studies. The long studies are that we give one group of students time to read and another group of students, we do something different. So we can compare two classrooms. And these studies can be a month, they can be two months, they can, they're often a year or longer. The longer the better, because then we have more reliable information. Uh, at the elementary and the secondary level, so at the, at the grade school and the high school level, uh, the most common approach that we use is called SSR, sustained silent reading. Sustained means over a long period of time. And in these studies, uh, what you do is you, you give kids time every day to read, say 20 minutes. You give them books that they can pick from, because if you don't have any books, you can't read. And the teacher will usually give them a little guidance, a little help. And Benico Mason has done, is doing amazing work in this area about guided uh, sustained silent reading. So that's an SSR program. At the college level and at the, at the adult level, usually we call these programs extensive reading, and most of the reading is done out of the classroom. But the same principle applies. What do we learn when we look at these studies? Who does, which, which group does better, the group that reads a lot or the group that does something else, such as 
traditional vocabulary activities or traditional language teaching. Well, Steve Krashen uh, has looked at this research, uh, both in SSR and in uh, extensive reading. And his conclusion is, is that usually the reading does better. Sometimes, however, the reading does the same as the traditional instruction. And some people have interpreted that to mean, oh, well, if it's the same as uh, uh, traditional instruction, why bother? But if you're a teacher or you're, you've been a language student, you know why that reading is still better than other something that is perhaps just as good. And the answer is it's, it's more entertaining. It's, it's more pleasurable for you as a student. And it's easier for you as a teacher, right? Because you don't have to be standing up there and, and doing, uh, uh, trying to teach kids things that most of them uh, don't really want to uh, listen to anyway. So uh, most of the studies that we've looked at, and especially in, when we look at something called effect sizes, which some of you may be uh, familiar with, uh, which tells us how big of an impact a study had, uh, th there's no question that reading is more effective than other ways of teaching. Nevertheless, I want to come back to this question in a minute because there are still a lot of people who say, well, but wait a minute. Why don't, we, why don't we just teach these kids the words? So before I do that, I want to introduce you uh, to a concept that I think is going to blow your mind. And blow your mind means here uh, it's going to change your view of reality. All right. Pretty good, right? This view is one that I would say less than 0.1% of the entire research and teaching community understands. So you are getting something here now that uh, I don't think, uh, you know, fewer than one out of a thousand people really know, uh, understand this concept. So you ready? Okay. There are two different ways of looking at research results. The, the most common way the, the one done by 99% of, of people, researchers and others, is to look at what I would call the quantity result. So let's say, for example, that you have, uh, you want to uh, give someone, you want to test two different kinds of diets to lose weight, okay? So you, you want to lose a little weight, so you decide you're going to test these two different types of diets. And then you, you give one group, we'll call it diet A, and they lose 10 pounds. Pretty good, right? Then we have another group, we'll call it diet B, and they lose two pounds. So you look at those two diets and you go, oh, well, obviously diet A is better than diet B, right? Because you lose more pounds in diet A. There's a piece of information that's missing here, and most of you have probably guessed it, which is, how long did it take diet A to, to lose 10 pounds versus diet B? Well, if I told you that diet A takes 10 weeks and diet B takes one week, now which one is better? Quantity doesn't tell us the most important piece of information. What we want to know instead is how efficient a method is. This could be a method for teaching math, it could be a method for teaching science, it could be a weight loss, whatever it is, it doesn't make any sense just to look at the, the raw number, the quantity. We want to know the efficiency. So how many words per hour are you picking up? How many pounds per week are you losing? Whatever it happens to be. Now, believe it or not, although it makes sense, I think, once you hear it, Almost no study that I've read on vocabulary acquisition, with the exception of ones that are done by people who are on this call, Steve Krashen and Benico Mason and a few others, almost no study looks at that question. They all look and say, oh, how many words did the kids learn versus how efficient was that method? I'll give you the punchline first, right? The punchline is the last line in a joke, right? Uh, the punchline here 
is that reading is much, much more efficient than other ways of trying to teach kids words. Now, I want to step back a little second uh, for a second because I want to explain just a little bit about uh, what's called explicit vocabulary instruction or traditional vocabulary teaching. Uh, it's become a big thing here in the United States and in, and in other countries to talk about uh, vocabulary teaching. And usually when we talk about vocabulary, we're talking about three different kinds of words. The first kind is what is called general vocabulary. And in English, that's the first, I would say, 3,000, 2 to 3,000 words. That's general vocabulary, which means that if you know the first 3,000 words, say, of English, you can understand most of the words on the page, somewhere probably between 85 and 95 percent of the words on, on any topic if you have general vocabulary. Now, unfortunately, that's not enough to understand adult level text. Even if you understand 85% of the words or 90% of the words, which is a lot, but that's still too much for you to uh, comprehend the message, to comprehend what you're reading. If you only understand 90%, you can do it, but it's hard. It means that one out of every 10 words, you don't know. And that's really difficult. So even though knowing 3,000 words is, is a great thing and it gets you, uh, it, it takes you from beginning, beginner to intermediate or low intermediate, it's not enough. So there are two other kinds of words that we need to know. For, for many topics, there is what's called technical vocabulary. And technical vocabulary are words like uh, photosynthesis, Right, the idea that energy from the sun comes down and is converted by the plant into energy that the plant can use. That's a technical term. Comprehensible input is a technical term. Input is a word that we use in lots of different fields, but in language acquisition, it has a very special meaning, right? And we all know what that is. It's, it's understanding messages. So comprehensible input is an example of a technical uh, technical vocabulary. And technical vocabulary is usually just used in one or, or a closely related set of fields. So physics has its own technical vocabulary, words like quarks. Um, and uh, psychology has its own technical vocabulary, terms like confirmation bias uh, or, or, or other you know, related concepts. So technical vocabulary is important but it's useful usually just for one particular area. There's a third type of word, and this is the type that everyone has been talking about in the research community in the last 10 years or so, and that is, it, it could be called sub-technical vocabulary. The word that's more commonly used now is academic vocabulary. And academic vocabulary are words that are used more in school across many different subjects than in daily conversation or in a fiction book and so forth. Now, important to point out here, I say that it's used more in school uh, books, school articles, academic texts, than it is in general or non-academic texts. However, however, it's still used, that vocabulary can still be found in fiction, in popular literature. And that's going to be a very important point. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Uh, first, very important, <clears throat> sip of coffee. OK. Now, so we've learned an incredibly important concept, which is efficiency instead of quantity. And we talked about the kinds of words that you can teach. Uh, there's a couple of researchers have tried to create a list of words that are used in different subjects. And uh, the one that's most popular is uh, uh, a woman uh, by the name of, um, and I'm blanking out here, Coxhead, Avril Coxhead. Uh, she's done some really good work in creating a list of words. And she came up with what's called an academic word list about 20 years ago. And that is that contains 570 words that are used more often in academic settings 
and that are an important part of understanding any kind of technical or any kind of uh, rather academic reading. So these would be words like analysis and data and treatment. You could be a psychologist and talk about data. You could be a physicist and talk about data. So that's an example of a subtechnical or academic word that's used across disciplines, across fields of study. So it immediately occurred to people after this list was created and even before with other lists. So researchers got this bright idea. They thought, well, why don't we just teach everybody those 570 words, right? Because if you have general vocabulary and you know the teacher is going to cover technical vocabulary, because those are typically words that are uh, about new concepts, we can teach this academic vocabulary and that will help students in all different areas. Sounds like a great idea, right? So they started to do studies and they did massive studies. I'm talking studies of thousands of students and dozens of teachers. And up to date, uh, up to this point, there's been at least about 10 uh, or 15 of these studies that I've looked at. And I'm sure there's a lot more that I, I haven't looked at. And so what these uh, studies did is try to uh, determine if you could teach students this academic vocabulary. So they did the traditional thing that you would expect. They, they trained the teachers. They gave them a list of words. They gave them lots of different activities. Uh, we're not talking, when I'm talking about this vocabulary, explicit vocabulary instruction, I don't mean just here's the word and here's the definition or here's the word and here's the translation. Uh, you know, hello is salam in Farsi. Yes, did you know that? So uh, that, is, that is the sort of traditional way of doing vocabulary uh, uh, teaching. And what, we've, what researchers discovered in the early 1980s and the late 70s is that that kind of vocabulary teaching doesn't help you understand a text that contains those words. So if you just give someone a, a simple definition or a translation, <clears throat> and then you give them, excuse me, and then you give them a text with those words in it, it doesn't help them all that much, or at least it doesn't help them as much as you might think. So, in, so after th this was discovered in the 80s, researchers, instead of saying, notice, instead of saying, hmm, maybe teaching words isn't the best approach. Did they say that? No. <laughs> of course they didn't. They said, well, let's teach them even more. Let, instead of just a definition, let's give them activities. Let's give them games to play. Let's have them write it in a sentence. Let's have them uh, uh, guess the word uh, and play uh, different games in the classroom and all sorts of activities. In other words, let's spend even more time on trying to teach vocabulary. And that's exactly what these studies did. And I'm not exaggerating here when I say that uh, these, these researchers have spent mass, a massive amount of time, a lot of time. In some cases, it's, it's like 20 minutes a day for the whole school year, just teaching these academic vocabulary words. Now, they don't try to teach all 570 academic vocabulary words. They usually pick a, a smaller set of, say, 100 or 120, something like that. <clears throat> and when they do that, and they, they look at, so, so, so they uh, create two different groups, just like we had diet A and diet B. Uh, in group A, we have uh, the, the students that get this vocabulary instruction, lots of vocabulary instruction, 60 hours a year, let's say. And then we have this other group that's doing something else. We're not really sure what, but it's not vocabulary instruction. Importantly, it's, it's not reading either. <laughs> They're not comparing it to reading. They're comparing it to doing something else that isn't vocabulary instruction. And usually that's not very well defined in the study. So at the end of the year, we give the two groups a test and wow, the group that got the vocabulary instruction did much better than the group that didn't get the vocabulary instruction. Sounds like a success, right? But now you know, now that you have had the secret of the universe revealed to you, you know that that's wrong. 
or at least that's incomplete. That can't be the whole picture because that's a quantity uh, uh, analysis. It's not an efficiency analysis. How many words did those kids pick up every day or every hour of instruction? And is that better than just plain old reading? Now, I remember I said earlier that we have lots of comparison studies uh, between sustained silent and extensive reading programs and other kinds of uh, language teaching. And we know that those in those studies, kids do better, students do better, adults do better, first language, second language. No matter where you look, the reading group does better than the non-reading group in most cases, especially if the program is given enough time to, uh, to last. To, 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 to take effect. Uh, there are other ways of determining how efficient reading is compared to uh, direct instruction. Now, you would think that there would be lots of studies that compare direct instruction to reading. But in fact, there are very few studies. In fact, I, I would say less than 20 studies that I've come across. When you do that, however, there's no question who the winner is. The winner in efficiency is reading. And let me give you a little sense. Of, I don't want to go through all these studies because I've done a lot of boring articles, which I can highly recommend uh, you read, especially since it's late at night there. You might want to pick one up uh, after this is over. And it'll help you sleep, I'm sure. Uh, not you, Benico, because it's 2 a.m. in the morning in Japan. So Here's the here's the uh, the big uh, the big conclusion that I came to. When you compare groups that are learning uh, that are reading to those that get reading but also get instruction, the ones that get reading plus instruction they do better quantity wise. But if we compare the efficiency of those two groups, the reading group does better. How much better? Well, in one analysis that I did, I looked at uh, storybook reading. So these were kids that were uh, uh, haven't learned to read yet, but the teacher would you know, sit up and read a book and talk about the story with them. They took one group and they tried to actually teach the kids words as they went through. So you would be reading the word once upon a time. There was a, uh, a big dinosaur. And then the teacher would stop and explain what a dinosaur was or sh show the kids a drawing of a, di a dinosaur, right? And then at the end of the story, the teacher would go back and she would review those words with the kids. They would do activities. It would be, uh, you know, they would do games and so forth. The other group, all they did was listen to the story. That's it. Who did better? Well, of course, the, teach, the, the group that was taught learned more words, but the group that was just listening to the story was, uh, got 63% more words. In other words, it, they were 60% more efficient than the group that got instruction. That pattern holds up no matter what you look at. It's true for elementary and middle school kids. If you take one group and you give them reading uh, and you take another group and you give them instruction, the instruction group will do better in terms of quantity, but not in terms of efficiency. Um, I've looked at studies uh, for second language uh, learners, adult learners, uh, and, uh, and when I look at these studies, same conclusion. Now, there's another way to try to compare different kinds of uh, methods. And I'm, I'm up to 35 minutes here, so uh, I'll try to wrap this up because I know uh, some of you want to hear a little bit about technology and, and um, some of the other work I've been doing uh, in the last 20 years with podcasting. But let me just give you one more piece of information before we um, move on. Another way of examining how efficient reading is, rather than giving, instead of giving someone uh, a bunch of reading to do and then coming back in five months and testing them. We can look at the texts themselves. We can look at the books themselves and see how often, how frequently words are repeated. Remember I mentioned earlier that the more you have words repeated, the more likely you are to acquire them. 
and Paul Nation and other researchers said have, have said, if you look at those read and test studies, those, those short-term studies, what we find is about 12 repetitions seems to be about right. It's not going to give you 100%, but it'll give you pretty close. If you look at a bunch of books and see how many of words that you think kids won't know, such as academic words, that, uh, and see how many times those are repeated, we can give an estimate of how many words you can pick up, how many words you can acquire by reading those books. So I, uh, Paul Nation actually is the one who, who first did a, a wonderful study about this in reading in a foreign language, the journal published out of uh, the University of Hawaii. I did a follow-up study. I looked at uh, 22 books. I looked at 22 young adult fiction books. So these are books that would typically be read by uh, a second, third, fourth, fifth grader in, uh, in, in English in the United States in their native language, or a lower intermediate student, uh, a, lower inter a lower intermediate student uh, in uh, a second language program. Okay, so someone, if those of you who are familiar with Benico Mason's work, uh, in uh, storytelling and guided uh, uh, sustained silent reading. Uh, this would be after you got through that. So these are not beginners. These would be intermediates or lower inter intermediates, okay? So what I did is I looked at these 22 books and I put them all in a computer program and it ended up being about a million words. We call this a corpus. A corpus is, uh, as some of you probably know already, a corpus is, a, is basically a list of all the words that appear in a text. So in my particular corpus, I had a million words. Pretty good, okay? A pretty good sized corpus. What I found is that, uh, and I decided to focus specifically on academic vocabulary. Remember I said earlier that academic vocabulary occurs much more often in school texts than it does in general or nonfiction texts, but it also appears in non in I'm sorry, in uh, non-academic or uh, fiction uh, or you know, general non-fiction. So those words do appear in these stories. Do they appear enough for you to acquire them? And what I discovered is, absolutely. Yes, they do. They absolutely do appear in, uh, uh, frequently enough. In fact, 84% of all of the words of that, that 570 uh, word list, 84% of them appear at least once. And, and I have to check myself to, I'm giving you the right uh, data here. 45% uh, of them occur 12 or more times, which means that about half of that list can be acquired just by reading stories, just by reading fiction. Okay. That's a pretty, uh, I'm going to ask you to mute your microphone if you came on. Thank you. Uh, so that's a pretty good chunk of vocabulary that you can pick up just by reading stories. It would take you, in case you're wondering, it would take you about 100, 115 hours to read that much English. Uh, if you were reading at about 100, let's, we'll call it 150 words a minute. That's what I've used because that's what fourth graders in native language, native English speaking fourth graders read at about 150 words a minute. It also is about, a, it's a low estimate for what intermediate readers in English as a second language read. So it's a, so it's a, a good rough general figure. It would take you about 114, 115 hours to read that. If we compare, so, well, that ends up being, I'll do the math for you that ends up being about 0 0.03 words per minute or about uh, roughly two words an hour. So every hour that you read, you're picking up two more academic words. Remember, these are the words that are gonna help you when you read your school text. So that's a pretty good payoff. That's a pretty good uh, reward for reading, about two words an hour. How does this compare to those uh, researchers that did the studies on teaching, on explicit teaching, direct instruction, 
traditional vocabulary instruction. I found that typically, if you are in a classroom where the teacher is spending lots of time teaching you words, you will learn about one third of a word per hour. Or to put it in other ways, it would take you three hours to learn about one word. If you read, you would learn a new word every 25 to 30 minutes. You would learn two words an hour. So which is better, one third of an, a, a word per hour or two words an hour? One third, two. I think I'm gonna choose two. I often get emails, uh, and at this point I'll try to transition and talk a little bit about the podcast. I often get emails from students that are taking the TOEFL or the IELTS. Uh, these are the admissions tests right, that, are, that international students often have to take to get into American and, and English uh, language universities. And people say, Dr. McQuillan, uh, I've got to take the TOEFL test uh, six months from now. What should I do? The first thing I, sell, I tell them is, well, how much time do you have to spend? And they'll say, oh, I can spend two hours a day, three hours a day. I say, OK, great. You should spend that time reading all three hours. And they look at me and say, well, what about the test prep book? What about studying the grammar? What about trying to memorize the vocabulary? And I explain to them that you can do that, but you're never going to get to where you need to be to pass the TOEFL just by doing that. Or if you do, it's going to take you a long, long time. By the way, I don't recommend trying to prepare for the TOEFL with only six months left, okay? You need, you need a little more time. But you don't need as much time as you think. If you read every day for an hour in English at a level that was appropriate to you, in other words, you could understand 95 to 98% of the words, so you, you, you could enjoy what you were reading, it would take you about three years to go from low intermediate to high advanced three years. If you read three hours a day, of course, it could take you just one year. So it is possible. In fact, it's not only possible, it's really the only way to efficiently improve your vocabulary. The only way to do that is reading. All right, so everybody, more coffee. Let's go. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Amir. It, it, it turns out that I, I, I think I've talked about the main things that I wanted to talk about. The only thing I was going to mention about vo vocabulary that I haven't uh, mentioned already is uh, the importance of the three, imp there are three important elements that you want in a good reading program. And we know this from Benico Mason's work. We know this from Jan Pilgreen's work back, uh, who was another student of Dr. Krashen back in the 1990s when I was uh, uh, a young boy. Uh, and <clears throat> So uh, there's three things that we know. You want to have books that students will enjoy reading and can read. So at the very lowest level, these would be books that would be, we call them graded readers. So uh, Oxford, uh, I think there's something like the Oxford Bookworms series, and there's the Cambridge series. There's lots of different commercial series of graded readers. So that's where you start. And when, the, when kids or students get above that level, then they can start reading the easier fiction in English, what we call young adult fiction that I mentioned uh, previously. And then after that, of course, <clears throat> they can move up to popular literature and so forth. What you need to understand is that that reading, fiction reading, is in a way academic reading also, because we can pick up words from young adult fiction. Uh, let's take the case of Harry Potter. Some of you may be familiar with Harry Potter, very popular book. Uh, there are seven Harry, at least seven Harry Potter books. I looked at the Harry Potter books and I did the exact same study as I did on the 22 different novels. I, I counted up how many times academic words appeared. And you know what I found? Exactly the same. It was the exact, literally nearly identical, exactly the same results. About 84% of the words academic words on the academic word list also appear in Harry Potter. And you'll pick up uh, the same rate, about 0.04 words per hour. It's a little more than two words an hour. 
just by reading Harry Potter. So if you want to improve your academic English, read Harry Potter. Why not? Of course, you can also read other things. And Steve Krashen has uh, some suggestions about uh, doing uh, self-selected reading in a certain in your own academic field. And of course, that's a great way of improving both technical and subtechnical vocabulary and academic vocabulary. But Harry Potter will help. Harry Potter will get you a good way, a good part of the way there. It won't teach you everything, right? It won't teach you all the vocabulary you need, but it will give you most of it or give you a good start at it. So uh, having books, really important. Time to read. If you don't have time to read and you don't, if you're, especially if you're dealing with younger children, uh, elementary and high school uh, students, giving them time to read is very important in class every day, if possible. Finally, I mentioned uh, at the start of the, of, of the talk, uh, the importance of guidance. And this is something that Benico Mason uh, has done a lot of work on, guided, uh, guided sustained silent reading. <clears throat> I hope I'm getting that term right, Benico. Uh, uh, teacher, the teacher has to help students, especially at the beginning. They're there to encourage them. They're there to guide them. So those three elements uh, are what you need to have a, a successful uh, program. All right, so let me switch over now. And I, I, I want to talk a little bit about technology. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of related to vocabulary as well. Um, I just want to say some general comments about vocabulary. First of all, I mentioned earlier, I do something called English as a, I used to do something called English as a second language podcast in which we recorded uh, lessons, stories, dialogues, and we explained them and we talked about them. So that's one way of doing it. What about all the other ways that you see on the internet? What about all the other apps? What about all the other software? Is it good? And how do you know if it's good or not? I'm gonna give you one thing that you can ask of any software or any app or any program. Just one question. And if you can answer, if you get the answer to this question, you will know whether it's any good or not, all right? The question is, how many people finished the course? Of the people who started the course, how many finished the course? If it's 50% or 70%, you may go, okay, not bad. That sounds, that sounds like I've, I've got a chance. That sounds like it works, right? But if it's 1% or 2% or 5%, Aren't you going to wonder whether that's really a good program? If you, if you want to know whether a program really works, find out how many people actually finish the program. And here's what we discovered. And uh, 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 Professor Ashtari has uh, done some work in this area in Farsi here in Los Angeles. If you go and look at the books that people use to try to improve their language, you'll find that hardly anyone gets past the first chapter. <laughs> People buy the book or they buy the app or they buy the Rosetta Stone software or whatever it is. Most people don't get past the first unit and almost nobody finishes the course. So what would, it, what, what would you say if I, if I was giving you a diet and I told you, well, this diet, you can lose 10 pounds but only 1% of the people who've taken, done the diet have actually finished it. You know that's not an efficient, uh, rather that, that's not an effective program. How is it then that we have all of these apps, all of this software, and none of it works? And I can tell you, having looked at the software, 1% is about average in terms of the, the, the number of people that finish Rosetta Stone, Tell Me More, Duolingo, whatever program you want to talk about, whatever app you want to talk about, almost nobody finishes them. They're complete failures. They're rubbish. They're trash. They're garbage. So how do these companies, first of all, why is that possible? And how do, how do companies make money? And then I'll, I'll, I'll open it up for questions here because I'm, I'm running long. Um, why, how is this possible? Well, let me ask a question for those of you who are listening here. How many of you are expert 
computer programmers, software programmers, uh, who can create an app all by yourself? Raise your hand. No. I'm guessing, I don't know you, but I'm guessing almost nobody fits in that category. Let's take the other group, the group of people who know how to do software programming, who know how to do apps, who can create pieces of uh, you know, websites. How many of those people know anything about language teaching? The answer is pretty close to zero. I know this because I've been asked by different software companies here in California. They've, they've asked me my advice and I've, I've, I've given it to them. And they go, oh, okay, thanks. And they walk away and they go and they do the traditional instruction just as they've always done it. So that's why, okay, that's why that most technology, 99% of all technology for language teaching is junk. The question is then, uh, how is it possible that these companies make money? How is it possible that you can sell a software program and still, and no one finishes it, and yet you still make money? The answer is that, that at least for foreign language learning in the United States, foreign language learning is like a pyramid, you know, like the pyramids of Egypt, right? Which are, they're, they're very big at the bottom and they come up to a point at the top. Foreign language learning is a pyramid. Most of the bricks, most of the students, most of the money is right at the bottom. And we know this because nobody finishes the first course, okay? So if you want to make money, you're going you're gonna to get it from the very first level because nobody else is going to continue on. And that's okay. You can make a lot of money just selling to the first level. Why do people recommend, why don't people complain? Why don't people say, this is garbage. I can't finish this course. What is this? Here's the answer. And uh, I just read this morning, literally, uh, a, a paper by Professors Krashen and Ashtari uh, about uh, Farsi, about books to learn Farsi uh, here in the United States that you can buy. And what Professor Ashtari and, 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 Krash, and Professor Krashen found is very similar to what I found when I looked at other languages like French and German and Spanish, which is hardly anybody finishes it. Why? Well, uh, uh, Ashtari and Krashen speculate, and I think they're absolutely right, that there are at least two reasons why. Number one, people blame themselves. I'm not a good language learner. I must not have very much talent for language learning. Oh, you know, I tried, but uh, I, I, you know, I've never been very good at that. So instead of blaming the software, which is garbage, they blame themselves. The other reason uh, is basically the same, which they'll say, well, I didn't have enough time. You know, I, if, if I'd spent more time on it, if I was more motivated, you know, I'm pretty sure I would have done really well. So nobody blames the software because they're too busy blaming themselves. Will this situation change in the near future? Probably not. Probably not. I doubt it very much. Because you've got to get these two groups, the people who know about language teaching, you guys, and the people who know about software development, you, those two people need to work together. And until they do, they probably we're probably not going to see a, 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 a lot of good technology to help language acquisition. I wish it were different, but there's no economic incentive, right? There's no economic reward for companies to try something new when they can make money on the old stuff, when they can just copy what everybody else has been doing for the last 50 years in traditional language instruction. That's kind of a downer, right? It's kind of a bummer. Uh, I don't mean to end on a negative note. Uh, the good thing is, however, that you're out there and you know uh, uh, what good language teaching is, and you can show that to your students. Uh, if you're a language teacher or if you're a professor, you can you're a professor, teach, you that, can teach, teach that. that to the others. Uh, to the I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, teach that to other people who are um, going to be teaching students. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's kind of my presentation, uh, Amir. If uh, you want to open it up to questions, I'm happy to, to do my best.